Earth is over four and a half billion years old. And in the last half a billion years, it's had five major extinction level events. This is when the total number of species dropped dramatically. Global apocalypses with the most recent being around 66 million years ago, when an asteroid the size of Manhattan hit the Earth. A colossal chunk of rock, traveling around 20 kilometers a second, struck the Gulf of Mexico, generating winds of over a thousand kilometers an hour and mega tsunamis over a mile high. Anything around what is now present-day Mexico and much of the United States was obliterated immediately. And over the years that followed, 75% of all life on the planet would cease to exist. Any of these magnificent creatures, weighing more than 25 kilograms, were lost, marking the end of the reign of dinosaurs and ushering a new age, the age of mammals. One of the most terrifying things about this extinction was that it came from outer space. There's something deeply unnerving about the idea of an asteroid just appearing out of nowhere, a planet killer, capable of ending life as we know it. I think what makes people most uncomfortable is that, at least with something like global warming, we have the power to change the impending doom. But with an asteroid, what power do we really have? In the movie Armageddon, spoilers, they did what most astronauts say is impossible. They landed a space shuttle on the surface of the asteroid so they could drill deep into its core to blow it up from the inside. It seems kind of crazy and, to be honest, there have been calculations on how likely this would be to work. And it's not good news. It would take something like 100,000 nukes to actually blow up an asteroid this way. So whilst the world was focused on the launch of the James Webb Telescope at the end of 2021, NASA quietly launched another mission, the Double Asteroid Redirection Test, a mission specifically designed to crash a probe into a smaller 150 meter asteroid to see if we can divert it. An asteroid much smaller than the one in the movies. It's kind of like throwing a tennis ball at an oncoming vehicle to see if we can change its direction. Although the effect is minor, if done early enough, there is a chance we could knock it a small amount, which would then build up over time, ultimately avoiding a collision. Well, that's the theory. We'll find out if it actually works later this year in October, when it's time to go full kamikaze. Either way, this got me thinking. Asteroids aren't the only extinction level events that might be lurking in space. There's probably a handful of scenarios that could easily lead to the annihilation of all life on this planet. I'm gonna go through some of these scenarios and in each of them, I will try to give a rough breakdown of what would happen, how likely the scenario is and what we could possibly do to survive it. We'll start with the less severe events and work our way up. Though in reality, all of these events are pretty catastrophic or they wouldn't be on the list. So with that out the way, let's begin. First up are supernovas. Supernovas are some of the most extreme releases of energy we have ever witnessed in the universe. Capable of releasing more energy than the rest of our galaxy combined, we definitely don't want to be too close to one when it goes off. But on July 4th, 1054, almost a thousand years ago, we did get front row seats to such an explosion. It completely confused the Chinese astronomers at the time who witnessed it. A bright star suddenly appearing out of the darkness, becoming so bright that it could be seen during the day, for months on end, before eventually disappearing altogether. These days, using our more powerful telescopes, we can see what this star really was, a supernova. And what remains of this explosion is one of the most gorgeous planetary nebulas, the Crab Nebula. Being 6,000 light years away, this explosion would have been a sight to behold. Yet it wasn't so close that it imposed a risk to Earth. But that's not to say there aren't stars much closer to us right now that could go supernova tomorrow. Betelgeuse is a red star only 600 light years from us 
and forms the left shoulder of the Orion constellation. It's absolutely gigantic, 600 times the size of our Sun, easily capable of swallowing the inner planets if it was in our solar system. Betelgeuse is due to go supernova any day now, and there's even a chance it already has. Because it's 600 light years away, it'll take that amount of time for the explosion to reach us, and when it does reach us, it'll be as bright as the moon, bright enough to cast shadows at night. The Earth's atmosphere will absorb most of the high energy gamma rays generated by the explosion, allowing only a small fraction to reach the surface lasting only a few seconds or minutes at the most. At 600 light years away, this still isn't close enough to pose a severe risk for life on Earth. For that, we need to get even closer, somewhere in the region of 30 light years away. At this distance, a supernova would disrupt satellites and wipe out at least half the ozone layer from the atmosphere. Suddenly, the sun's rays would begin to feel like being under a magnifying glass, cooking the surface of the planet and melting away what little ice gaps we have left. The huge amounts of radiation absorbed in our atmosphere would also begin to fuse the two most abundant elements, nitrogen and oxygen, into a thick smog of poisonous nitrogen oxide. This would start to choke our planet, first blocking sunlight so that plants can't photosynthesize, and then later forming acidic rain clouds that would pour acid rain. It all sounds pretty bad and, to be honest, it wouldn't be great. There would be a significant risk to life, but not quite enough for a global extinction event. We'd survive. Supernovas have been happening for billions of years and this isn't our first rodeo. As far as we can tell, there has never been a major extinction event on the planet due to a supernova. But then again, we doubt any have actually been as close as 30 light years before. If there was one, our best defense would be early detection, something like picking up the initial neutrino burst or gravitational waves, a warning that might give us only a few hours to respond before an impending explosion hit us. The best way to survive such a blast would be to stay indoors, or even underground which would minimize exposure to the most harmful radiation that would hit us in the first few hours. Although we don't suspect there are any stars likely to go supernova within 30 light years of us, you might be shocked to find the nearest candidate is only 154 light years away, which is uncomfortably close, but it is reassuring to know that it is slowly moving away from us. So no need to go by all the factor 50 sunscreen just yet. The next cosmic catastrophe is actually a group of them called rogue bodies. And specifically what I mean by that is rogue planets, stars, and even black holes. Now these are a little terrifying. I mean, it's one thing being hit by an asteroid the size of Manhattan, but it's a completely different ball game being hit by one of these. And actually, even to call them a catastrophe is a huge understatement. In the event of a rogue planet colliding with us, the Earth would almost certainly be destroyed. Or reformed, as I should say. Because we think the Earth has already collided with another planet in the past. A planet called Thea, roughly the size of Mars today. We think it struck the early Earth and might even be the origin of much of Earth's water. Computer simulations suggest that Thea was travelling around 4 kilometers a second when it struck the Earth, at a 45 degree angle though these are still being debated. The debris that was left over formed what is now our moon, a curiously big satellite in comparison to the size of our planet. Of course, any collision with a planet these days would mean destruction of all life on Earth. And it's likely that whatever's left would be completely unrecognizable, looking nothing like Earth or the planet that hit it, but something new, a new world, with debris orbiting it that would eventually form a new moon later down the line. Our own moon certainly wouldn't make a good refuge to hide out in a rogue planet collision, because the gravity introduced by another planet would either bring the moon into the collision or send it out into the solar system, destined to hit one of the other bodies, or even be slingshot out of the solar system entirely. And this is exactly how rogue planets form in the first place. 
Solar systems are very rarely as balanced and stable as the one we live in. They are often far more chaotic and unpredictable. When planets form, it's not uncommon for them to collide and interact so that one or more is usually kicked out of its host system. These wandering, starless planets are destined for a dark, cold and lonely voyage across interstellar space, drifting for thousands or even millions of years before coming close to the next star system. And they might be more common than you think. Some of the higher estimates say rogue planets could number in the trillions, meaning they'd outnumber the total amount of stars in our galaxy. What's worse is they are very hard to see. Because they don't emit any light of their own, our best way of detecting them is when they pass directly in front of a star or other light source so that it appears dimmer than what we would expect. This means a rogue planet could catch us completely off guard, revealing itself only as it starts to reflect the sun's light as it enters our solar system. But a rogue star, on the other hand, would be much easier to see, because they give off their own light. Rogue stars are drifters, intergalactic stars that aren't native to the Milky Way galaxy and don't flow with the regular movement of the rest of the stars. The nearest we'll get to seeing a rogue star will be when the Milky Way collides with the Andromeda galaxy. 250 billion stars colliding with an even bigger galaxy of a trillion stars. Galaxy mergers are an essential process in the evolution of galaxies and it's likely how they became so big in the first place. Yet something that you would almost never expect is that in a galaxy merger, there are no star collisions. And this is purely due to the insane distances between stars in galaxies. To demonstrate what I mean, let's do a quick exercise. Imagine our sun was the size of a ping pong ball floating somewhere above St Pancras train station in London. Do you know how far the nearest star, Proxima Centauri, would be? Is it A, 100 meters, B, one kilometer away, or C, 10 kilometers away? Okay, so it's actually a trick question because the correct answer is D, Venice. That's right, if our sun were the size of a ping pong ball, the nearest star would be 1,100 kilometers away. That means that 99.99% of our galaxy is empty space. Although on a larger scale the stars of Andromeda will mix and combine with our own to become a super galaxy, the Milk Dromeda galaxy, in reality there'd be no actual star collisions. But that's not to say there wouldn't be chaos. The problem with rogue stars, or any of the stars getting too close to us, is not with direct collisions but rather destabilizing our orbits, and in the most extreme cases, turning us into a rogue planet by flinging us out of our own solar system. Recently, a team of researchers ran 2,880 simulations on the effects a flyby star would have on our system. They found that if a star were able to move Neptune's orbit by just 0.1%, it would create an instability that would ripple through the planets eventually reaching the Earth in around 20 million years or so. In these simulations, nearly a third had almost no detectable effects, which is good. But in around 30 of them, or 1%, it was an absolute disaster. With the planets slamming into each other, typically Mercury hitting Venus, or Uranus, Neptune and Mercury being thrown out of the solar system entirely. And yet despite these odds, there is still a worse rogue body. The rogue black hole. With the potential of being even more gravitationally fierce than a star, and with the added stealth of being almost completely invisible, a rogue black hole is essentially the worst parts of a rogue planet combined with a rogue star. Although we can see black holes that are feeding, a rogue black hole would be starved, and therefore almost invisible. It would give off some clues, mostly as it gravitationally lends the Milky Way behind it, curving the light due to the intense curving of space-time around it. Let's say a rogue black hole with the mass of the Sun did wander into our solar system. What would that look like? The first thing it would do would be to destabilize the Oort cloud, creating new comets that it would then launch into the inner solar system, perhaps being one of the only warnings we'd ever get before its imminent arrival. 
By the time it approached the outer planets, any of the gas giants caught in its wake would begin to have their layers stripped, deforming them as they get pulled into an accretion disk around the event horizon, finally revealing itself to us in its full glory. By the time the black hole reaches the asteroid belt, the tidal forces on Earth would be so severe that it would have caused supervolcano eruptions and tectonic plate movements across the planet. Nothing but a lava world would remain, a literal hell on Earth. Most people worry about being spaghettified, but in reality, we'd be obliterated long before then. If it continued towards the centre of our solar system, it would eventually begin a much longer and even battle with our sun. A gravitational tug of war that could last millions of years and one that we'd never get to witness. The only upside to the rogue body scenarios is that they are incredibly rare. The same researchers that modelled a rogue star entering our solar system also calculated the chance of a rogue star to be about 1 in 5 billion years. It really does seem that rogue bodies are an incredibly unlikely scenario and for good reason. There's almost no chance of us surviving one, and perhaps the only thing that could help us sleep at night is knowing that you're more likely to win the lottery three times in a row than you are to die from a rogue black hole. And I think that's important. In order for us to consider the severity of these extinction events, we really need to consider how likely they are to happen. Which is why the next few scenarios are in my opinion some of the most deadly. By far the most likely scenario on the list is the extreme solar flare. Solar flares are a well-known phenomenon that can happen as often as several times a day. They are the result of intense eruptions of electromagnetic radiation triggered by stored magnetic energy in the sun's atmosphere. When really big flares occur, they tend to be accompanied by huge CMEs, coronal mass ejections monstrous fiery whips that can send plasma hurtling towards the inner planets. Earth shields us from this with its magnetosphere, causing the magnetic fields to compress on the day side which is absorbing the brunt of the blow, and the night side forming a longer magnetic tail which then whips back towards Earth when the flare passes. Solar flares come in a range of classifications and of increasing severity with X, standing for extreme, being the most deadly. They're also denoted by a number, with a higher number symbolizing an even greater strength in that class. In 2003, Earth received the greatest solar flare ever recorded, in what is now dubbed the Halloween Storms, an X50 rated solar flare, somewhere between 10 and 100,000 times more powerful than a standard extreme class solar flare. The flare created a geomagnetic storm that saturated our X-ray detectors and knocked power out in Sweden. It blew transformers in South Africa and damaged countless numbers of satellites, with some like SOHO being completely unresponsive. Astronauts in the ISS had to move to the more shielded parts of the Russian orbital segment to protect themselves from the increasing radiation levels and the aurora borealis was so widespread that it was visible as far south as Texas. Even the Mars Odyssey orbiter observed activity in the Martian atmosphere as solar particles interacted with it, and the Cassini probe which was on its way to Saturn felt the wave. The flare had an aftermath on our upper atmosphere, destroying up to 60% of the ozone in the higher latitudes a completely unexpected and unprecedented loss. Flares of this magnitude are rarely experienced, with the last big one being in 1859. But it also brings forward a scary prospect. If humanity continues to destroy the Earth's ozone layer, another 50% let's say, what's going to stop the next big solar flare? And I'm sure this isn't the most extreme flare the sun is capable of though I'm not exactly in a rush to find out what is. Because of the sun's unpredictable activity, it's really hard to say exactly when or how extreme the next solar flare will be. But there is one solar event which is going to happen, guaranteed in our future, and will absolutely mark the end of all life on this planet. That 
is the dying sun. Our sun is not eternal. It's a little older than the Earth, somewhere around 100 million years, making it 4.6 billion years old. And if it was a human, it would be in its mid-40s. Although it will reach an age of around 10 billion years, like anything that ages, it's going to go through some changes, some of which will be pretty disastrous for Earth. Over the next billion years, the sun's radiation will increase by 8%. For every half a percent increase, the global temperatures here on Earth rise by 1 degree Celsius, meaning the average temperature here on Earth will rise by a whopping 16 degrees Celsius. During this time, the sun will have started to burn helium in its inner core, a much more energetic reaction that will result in more heat entering its outer layers, where hydrogen continues to be burned, causing huge expansion and ballooning outwards, transitioning our star into a red giant. It will go through periods of immense instability, ballooning outwards for periods of time and then contracting again with each one being bigger than the last until eventually it will start to engulf the nearest planets. First Mercury, then Venus, but eventually Earth too. This won't happen until long after the Earth becomes uninhabitable from the rising temperature, a level we expect to reach in around 300 million years. Not that far away when you compare it to the first dinosaurs that walked the Earth only 250 million years ago. This is something that is really going to happen. There is no avoiding the fact that the sun will eventually roast the earth, destroying its gorgeous blue atmosphere and igniting its surface into a fiery red lava world. Everything we've ever created, all of the wonders of the world, natural or man-made, will be completely destroyed. The only way for us to actually survive this scenario is to become a multiplanetary interstellar species by that time. And almost unbelievably, just as the Earth becomes uninhabitable, some of the outer solar system moons of Jupiter, Saturn and Neptune will start to become habitable. Kind of a crazy coincidence if you stop to think about it. Almost as if our already incredibly rare solar system has a built-in redundancy for life itself. The chance for life to escape its dying sun if it's sophisticated enough to do so. The dying sun is definitely the finale, the ultimate guaranteed end on Earth's horizon. A cosmic extinction level event that is completely unavoidable for the Earth. No matter what we do, there is no escaping this endgame. Yet, it's going to be a long time until that happens. Hundreds of millions of years, and a lot can change in that time. This is also why the dying sun is not the last event on this list. There is one more, and you might be surprised to hear me say what it is. An asteroid. Yeah, I'm going full circle on this video, and for good reason. I honestly believe that the biggest cosmic threat to life on this planet comes from an asteroid. The last major asteroid wiped the dinosaurs out 66 million years ago. And there have been several other smaller impacts since. There really is no telling when the next major asteroid will hit Earth. The threat is constantly there. We could wake up tomorrow and find out there's another asteroid the size of Manhattan heading to the Earth for a collision six months from now. And unlike most of the scenarios on this list, an asteroid collision really is one of the few that we can actually do something about. We can't stop a star going supernova or stop our own sun expanding into a red giant. We can't avoid a rogue star or black hole finding its way into our solar system, ripping it apart. But we might, just might be able to push a small asteroid a few kilometers wide away from the Earth. So maybe NASA's DART mission, its experiment to try and divert a small asteroid, should be the mission we're all paying attention to later this year. It could represent humanity's first real steps in denying the inevitable fate that space often presents us with. Our refusal to accept past catastrophes as unavoidable outcomes that we can't do anything about. Or to steal another quote as famously used in the Interstellar movie, our refusal to go quietly into that good night. Hey guys, if you're still watching, then thank you so much. 
this is the longest video I've ever made on the channel and if it's something you really liked then please let me know in the comments below. Honestly I love reading each and every comment, it makes me so happy knowing that you guys enjoy my content. I have around 700 subscribers now which blows my mind considering I had like 5 subscribers just a few months ago. So a huge thank you to all of you that have subscribed. Anyway that's all from me and I'll see you guys real soon. Peace.